Welcome back to the Automation Podcast, the world's number one industrial automation product and technology show. Thanks to you, our audience of highly skilled automation professionals. Thank you for being a member of our audience and for tuning back in this week. Now, for those of you who are new to the show, my name is Sean Tierney of Insights and Automation. And each week I invite a new vendor to come on the show to tell us about their products and technologies. And during their presentation, I play the role of the audience asking questions that I think you, the members of the audience might have. And uh, given that a quarter of the audience listens to the show, not watches it, but just listens to it, I'll also try to call out uh, anything that I see in the slides of the presentation that I think that you, those of you who are listening, may want to know about. So with all that said, I want to wish a warm welcome to Sean Foley for coming back on the show. It's been a little while, but we are glad to have him back on the show. Sean, how are you doing? And welcome back to the Automation Podcast. Hey, Sean, thank you so much uh, for having me back on. It's always an honor to be to be on your podcast. Really, really love your your content. Been a follower for years, so always great to be back on. I'm, I'm doing really well. I'm really excited to be here. Um, always great to, to catch up with you. Well, and, and I have been trying to, to stay away from this because I knew we were going to do this podcast. So I'm coming into this knowing nothing about Banner Remote I.O., but I'm excited. You know, I've uh, when I first got in this business, I, that's when I first became aware of Banner some 34 years ago. I've always been a fan of your products. And um, so I'm excited to learn about what Banner Remote I.O. is. So let me turn it back to you and, and let's learn about this new uh, product. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Banner's remote I.O. portfolio. So I'm really excited um, to be a part of the team as a product manager for Banner remote I.O. products. And it's something that's fairly new to Banner. Banner's pretty new to this space. You know, Banner's been in the automation world for, for decades and decades, 50 plus years. And we have many a long history of producing solutions for sensors, lighting products, um, safety solutions. But now we're getting into a new space and it's really excited, uh, exciting to be a part of it and providing remote IO solutions for OEMs. Remote IO has been around for quite a while um, and banners it, with regards to remote IO is fairly new to the space. But we what we do have some really unique solutions that really set us apart, in my opinion, from other other manufacturers in the space. So I'm really excited today to talk about the portfolio talk about some applications and success stories, how we have been able to help some of our valued customers with this, this technology, some of the things that we could do that really, really set us apart. Um, whether it be our form factors, whether it be our, our advanced programmability, there's a lot of things we could do. And we really like helping and supporting particularly machine builders, with their remote IO solutions uh, with these products. So uh, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to get started before diving into the portfolio, I think it's important to look at kind of the, the evolution of, of when you talk about remote IO and the concept of, of decentralized automation, right? It's kind of a, an evolution that's happened over the years. Here's just a slide uh, for the listeners. If, 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 if this is an image on the screen showing kind of the evolution of connecting your sensors, connecting your IO back to a control system, connecting your sensors and IO back to a PLC. You know, throughout so many applications and uh, throughout the history of automation, uh, so many machine builders would typically wire their sensors, wire their I.O. back to their PLC directly. So what that would mean is you'd have your, your sensors, whether it be a photo eye or another sensor or another lighting product or actuator, going back to your PLC directly. And so what that would mean is you'd ha typically have to run your cables from your devices back to your input cards and your plc and this is still very very prevalent in the world of, of automation as we all know uh just wiring your sensors directly back to your your plc to input cards and the challenge with that though and i I've, i'm sure you've kind of run into this sean is is at times that could lead to very large control cabinets it could lead to lots of different input cards and output cards it could lead to um oftentimes challenging challenges with troubleshooting lots of if you have lots of devices lots of sensors say 128 sensors that you have to wire back to your plc each one of those sensors has four wires that's that's over 500 opportunities to make a wiring error and there are challenges with wiring the io directly um, 
And then we we kind of move to the next thing, which a lot of uh, machine builders have been using passive junction blocks. So these blocks that have, instead of sensors having cables running uh, directly back to the PLC, they're using passive junction blocks with a typically a bulky home run connector going back to their PLC. Very similar to directly wiring I/O, um, but just another method. Um, and then we can start moving into network I/O blocks. So having uh, instead of having to wire your sensors back directly to your your PLC, you would land it on a network I/O block and just have an Ethernet cord set going back to your PLC. And these network blocks typically have things like analog inputs or discrete inputs. Going further, we're looking at talking about I/O link and using I/O link masters. This is where we could really expand on the number of devices you could use, and, and there's many advantages to I/O link. And if you actually um, we should a podcast uh, not too long ago, Sean, on, on the advantages of using IO-Link networks, but it's another great thing that a lot of OEMs have standardized on um, for bringing back IO to their control systems. And really excited to be a part of the team at Banner that have lot, brought a lot of products to the market for using discrete hubs, IO-Link masters, IO link converters for bringing back not just discrete IO to a control system, but analog IO and other different types of, of signals back to a, a PLC. So Banner's been very active in this space um, for the last two years and working on our IO link solutions. Uh, so IO link has been used quite a lot. And you know, the advantages are immense with using IO link, as you've probably seen, Sean. Um, and then we move to kind of a something that's very unique to banner and that's be using using modbus rtu networks to bring back uh io back to your plc so in addition to io link converters io link hubs for bringing back discrete pnp signals or analog signals we've also got a modbus variety and so when you look at modbus rtu versus io link networks modbus also has some unique advantages io link it's point to point so if you have an IO-Link master, you can only connect one IO-Link device to each port on your IO-Link master. So you have an IO-Link master port, you could connect one IO-Link device to it. Um, the, the nice thing with that is though, you could use hubs. So you could have a, an IO-Link hub, which is an IO-Link device, and have 16 discrete sensors bring brought back to your IO-Link master. When you look at Modbus, however, and you would use a Modbus controller instead of an IO-Link master, like what we show here, you could have a, a one of our DXM controllers with five Modbus RTU ports. The nice thing with this uh, topology, though, is the ability to tee into large numbers of these Modbus converters or Modbus hubs for bringing back I/O to a PLC. So we have converters and hubs in both the Modbus variety and the IO-Link variety. So we, it allows us to really go into a a machine builder and mix and match Modbus and RTU, uh, Modbus RTU and IO-Link networks for price and performance. Sometimes it's about finding what's the right formula for bringing back IO to your control system. The nice thing is the different form factors too, is you get to mix and match housings. We call it right sizing your IO for the application because Banner has both one port, two port, three port, four port, and eight port converter options or hub options for converting these legacy signals like analog and discrete over to IO link or Modbus RTU. Does that does that kind of make make sense, Sean, uh, from your perspective? And I know you've uh, you've probably seen the evolution. Um, and there's still it's still there's still many uh, customers out there who, who use you know directly wired IO. In a lot of their applications and um, moving to remote IO system, have you kind of seen some of these evolutions? And st we're still seeing them, of course. But uh, do you see a lot of this uh, uh, OEMs and machine builders transitioning to these networks as opposed to direct wire IO? Yeah, you know, I do, and I think you know, there's you know different applications. So IO Link is great for some applications, especially when you need more than just the analog or digital signal if you need some of the intelligence of that that sensor right and sensors are just getting smarter and smarter and smarter but 
Um, in some cases, especially for the end user, the Modbus side is great because, you know, we're talking 485, we're talking 4,000 feet, we're talking daisy chaining, we're talking simple, long distances, not a bunch of hubs and switches, you know, so um, Modbus uh, RTU has always been a favorite for those type of, you know, longer applications, not so much for an OEM per se, but for maybe an end user, and I think... Um, so definitely there's a difference here in, in who's using what, but I think we're seeing a lot less direct wired I.O., unless it's a very, very small machine. Then we're seeing a lot of direct I.O. But again, if they need the intelligence out of the sensor, maybe they have an I.O. link module in the PLC chassis instead of, you know, just a standard digital input module, right? So exactly. um, definitely I'm right, in, I'm right in tune with what you're showing here. Absolutely. You know, I, I think um, when you talk about some of the advantages I've seen, you know, I, with with remote IO and remote IO has been around for for a while, but one of the, a lot of things I like to talk to are are the flexibility. So remote IO allows for distributed control systems, so that kind of enables flexibility in the placement of IO blocks throughout the the facility. Another big one is reduced wiring. So simply put, I think you've probably seen this a lot. Is it just decreases the amount of wiring needed? You know, as, as IO blocks can be can be placed close to the field devices and your sensors. This reduces your your installation times, your your maintenance costs, your your wiring mistakes. And a, a key thing I've seen many OEMs see as an advantage when they're transitioning to remote I/O is the standardization on easy to install, cost effective, and, and frankly, readily available M12 connectivity in in tons of applications. Um, and you know, reduced wiring is huge. And I, would you would you see reduced wiring as kind of one of the big drivers? A lot of kind of OEMs and and machine builders are transitioning to this this um, remote I/O strategy. Yeah, you know, and I think I, I need to say this for some of the old timers on here. We're talking when we say that remote I/O, we mean distributed I/O. When we say distributed I/O, we're talking remote I/O. That those two those two words are used interchangeably. I know some people remember the old networks that came out in the late 70s, early 80s that were, you know, we're not talking about that. We're talking about modern day distributed remote I.O. that uh, that you wire your devices into and then goes back to your control system. So I thought I'd just say that because I know old timers like me, we, we used to always uh, get a little bit like, well, that product's not available on remote I.O. We're talking about distributed I.O., remote I.O. So um, in any case, yeah, that's that's and, and it's almost. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, a lot of the major PLC vendors are telling me that in many instances, people are just buying the PLC, putting it in its own little rack, and they're using 100% distributed remote I.O., right? They're not doing any local chassis I.O., and a lot of times that's because the local chassis I.O. is more expensive than the distributed I.O. or the remote I.O., right? So, um, which is to me is a trend that I, I was surprised about. But here's another trend that the major manufacturers are telling us. What you guys are offering here is the trend. People are buying this uh, this uh, you know machine mounted type of I/O like you're showing in these pictures. Um, that's becoming the norm. People are starting to get away, and I, this surprised me. But OEMs and and other companies uh, in this space they're getting away from installing an enclosure and then sticking traditional uh, you know IP20 you know distributed I.O. in it, like, I don't know, you know, whether it's Alan Bradley or Siemens or whoever, right? Um, Schneider or whoever, they're they're getting away from that. They're, they're putting everything on the machine. And that surprised me, but that trend is borne out by the fact that, you know, if you just talk to the major vendors, that's what they're seeing, a move to this type of, you know, um, and, and I, I haven't seen all the slides, but I'm assuming this is not IP20, just dust tight uh, products that you're offering. Exactly. These are these are going to be IP67, IP68, and yeah, I totally agree with you on the trends we're 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 seeing with with these products for sure. With with a lot of these, you know, machine builders and manufacturers moving to kind of the distributed and remote I/O solutions. I think also, if you look at in terms of PLC wiring and wiring sensors and I/O to your PLC, being able to simplify wiring and reduce wiring, it really also means significantly faster installation times for a lot of machine builders. Oh, yeah. And another thing I've run into is modularity. So if say you're a, a machine builder and you're building a, a machine for a, an end user and you're building it and you're first building it in your, in your factory and you have to ship it, 
when they're first building the prototypes and they're building the machines in in house, they have to disassemble it and ship it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the nice thing about connectorized connectivity. Uh, is the quick disassembly and reassembly of these machines. If they're hardwired back to the PLC input cards, it means you have to unscrew every screw terminal to disassemble it. And I think the modularity approach is important too. Um, in terms of other things I've, I've seen is is the scalability. Um, they're easily expandable. I, I, I'm sure you've kind of seen this too, Sean, is sometimes they maybe sensors needed to be added to a, a machine and and you know, don't want to dive into the control cabinet, but they could just add new sensors to these blocks and bring in IO and just add new sensors without increasing the size of their control cabinet. And, you know, that's a, that's a big thing, I think too. And, you know, I could, I keep talking on, uh, on a lot of the advantages, but, um, you know, the improved reliability, you know, by minimizing the distance between sensors and actuators and the control system, you know, these remote IO systems can also improve signal integrity. Uh, so if you're using analog sensors and you're converting it over to um, IO link or to a Modbus RTU or serial network, um, you're going to be able to eliminate a lot of the shielded cord sets that are sometimes more expensive. Often, t- well, we know they're typically more expensive than standard wiring, uh, but also can sometimes be difficult to source. So I've kind of seen a lot of that. and. Um, when we kind of look at, um, we've got the two different varieties, and we we we'll talk a little bit more about the products. But a question I often get is, you know, Sean, the, these two solutions you got this this portfolio of products for getting data to your control systems um, via both, say, Modbus RT or IO Link. We've got the two varieties. Um, you know, they, people always say it's like oh, almost like Lego building blocks for b- right sizing your I/O for the application. I don't really kind of like that the way they describe it. But when do you use one versus the other? Well, you know, you're looking at Modbus RTU versus I/O Link. So both, you'll be able to use standard M12 cables, unshielded M12 cables, because as you're converting these signals over to both, say, I/O Link or to Modbus, it's going to make those signals immune to noise. Um, if you look at Modbus versus IO Link, there's a, a, a few important differentiators. One, if you're, say, connecting a Modbus server device, such as a Modbus hub or converter, to a Modbus client controller, you have the ability to connect, like you said, Sean, 4,000 feet of range. So you could have your IO very far away from your, your control system, you know, up to 4,000 feet. Um, IO link is is you're you're gonna have that 20 meters. That's part of the IO link spec between, from your IO link master to your IO link device. With Modbus, there's no real data transmission limitation, and with IO link, there is going to be a process um, data limited to 32 bytes in and 32 bytes out. It's typically not a uh, an issue. Um, snap, uh, you know, Modbus is an open protocol, so. Each that is means that each manufacturer chooses data and communication settings for each device. You know, with IO Link, it's part of this consortium of over 500 or 400 different manufacturers. So you could connect anyone's IO Link device and it should work with everyone's IO Link masters. And that's a huge advantage of IO Link, in addition to some many more. Um, but when you look at a, another thing with Modbus, if you have a Modbus controller with Modbus client ports, you could have up to over 32 devices on each of those client ports going back to one IP address for bringing the data back to your PLC. And so by using some of these hubs, we've seen applications where machine builders and OEMs have been really able to consolidate the amount of IP addresses and have a lot of IO going back to their PLC using Modbus RTU um, as the, the the kind of conduit for getting that data. Uh, it kind of enables more devices than um, kind of ever before with by using these kind of Modbus client ports to bring back uh, a lot of IO to a, to a PLC. It, so with IO link, it's point to point. So you could have IO link devices such as sensors, IO link hubs, IO link converters connected on each port of your IO link master and bringing back the data. Um, 
there is, you know, I often like to advise when people are, you know, where do I use one versus the other? Um, it's it's to, kind of re, you know, look at the system, look at the topology, and look at the application requirements to really figure out what's the right mix and match of products for optimum price, performance, reliability. Um, speed becomes a, an issue, uh, can become a, become a factor as well in making these decisions. How far away your I.O. is to your, your PLC. Um, I think questions like this, but this is a slide that just kind of goes through. We've got these two varieties for bringing back the data. And kind of want to use one versus the other, and just it's important to kind of figure out what's the best fit for the application early on as you're planning the system. But the nice thing is, if you ever have any questions on this and you want to, to optimize your system design, feel free to reach out to the Banner uh, support team. We've got a really great uh, application engineering team group here. And we've got a lot of uh, very advanced application engineers who are really uh, have a great level of, of knowledge in this in this area. One to use one versus the other. Um, you know, I want to jump in there for a second. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people may be thinking, you know, I stopped using Modbus RTU because, you know, we just needed so much data through it. And, and we're not talking about having 50 PLCs send thousands of integers to each other every minute right that's not what we're talking about this is not to replace your industrial ethernet what we're talking about is a way to use modbus rtu to talk to a bunch of field io which yeah. is not tens of thousands of integers right so um i just want to throw that out there because i know a lot of people think oh you know modbus rtu it's kind of like data data sidewalk right it's 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 not designed for huge amounts of data that go between controllers and yes that that is true but here we're talking about just imagine, you know, how many how many sensors can you get in a hundred words of data, right? I mean, yeah. you can get a whole bunch. You can get probably more than you'll ever need on your machine on a single machine. So, it's for these type of applications, it is just really sweet. But again, you know, IO Link has that ability to get that additional. You know, if you have everything close by, you don't need that four thousand feet. There's so much these intelligent sensors from Banner and other companies have so much more information you can get out of them and you can even configure them, right? Like I know Banner has these great um, illuminated uh, beacons and light stacks and all these things that you can actually configure them right across the IO link, right? So yeah. you're not down there with dip switches and, you know, trying to, you know, you don't even have to get into that. You can do that all via the software. So uh, those are some of the advantages and some of the things that I think about as I was looking at your slide and I'll turn it back to you, Sean. That's that's such a great point, and uh, you know, talking on on, on the IO link, I we, uh, we we had a discussion on another podcast and the advantages. I think I believe it's called the Eight Advantages of IO link, and I remember I really enjoyed yep. chatting with you about those. And yeah, like you said, you know, access to sensor and device level data with IO link is huge. Being yeah. able to know when a, a sensor is overheating or a lens is starting to get dirty on a photo eye. Or maybe you want to change the configuration remotely on your your sensor if you're running a different product, like recipe mm -hmm. control, yeah. dynamically changing sensor settings from the PLC. Um, if that's something where you want access to sensor level data and device level data, IO Link will be your commonly uh, the route to go. I was gonna say back in the 90s, um, you know, we had to go out into the field and reach self teach these sensors every time uh, we ran a new product, and that that was not efficient. So yeah. being able to do that in, you know, based on recipes, like you said, uh, the night and day difference than having to go out there. I mean, in some cases, the customer would buy, the plant would buy multiple sensors and you just use, you know, sensor one for this product, sensor two for that product, because they couldn't go out there and redo the self-teach every time. So this yeah. is, um, this that's a very good point. Back to you, Sean. Yeah, that's so true. And, you know, with setting d device configuration, you know, so many devices, have the push buttons and they have all with that it's kind of almost virtually infinite sensor configuration possibilities which is great but also what what if someone say a forklift driver runs over your your photo eye or your your sensor and it's been in operation for three or four years and and you have to reconfigure it uh, before io link you would typically have to go and online or if you have the hard copy, get the manual and play around with the push buttons on the sensor to the device. I hope it works. Plug it back in and they kind of hope for the best. With IO Link, you could rest assured using data storage mode in the iLink Master, it'll automatically upload the sensor configuration for you. Um, so another another really sweet advantage of, of IO Link is, is that the ability to do um, backup and restore mode or data storage remote for 
device configuration. So you plug it in, set it and forget it, and it's a huge advantage of, of IO-Link. Yes, it is, absolutely. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the solutions Banner has in this space. I'm really uh, excited about, when you look at our, our multi-protocol ethernet blocks, um, and using those two ways of getting the data, both you know that Mobbus and IO Link, uh, here's kind of our our selection of multi-protocol Ethernet products. We first of all, we've got the DXM R90X1, and so what is this product? It's really the consolidator for Modbus networks, like we've been talking about. So being able to use the five Modbus client ports on the DXM R90 to talk. Um, to these Modbus server devices, Modbus converters, Modbus hubs, for accessing those the, the data from these uh, you know legacy sensor signals and bringing it back over um, Ethernet IP, Modbus TCP or Profinet back to a control system to send the data where it needs to go. Um, this is the control that we have for that um, um, area. We've also got our four port. IO link master with multi protocol interface. It's the DXMR 94K. And so this is going to have instead of the four Modbus client ports at the bottom, it actually has four IO link master ports at the bottom there. And what it also has is a fifth port that you see right here, and it's not IO link, it's Modbus RTU. So that opens up some interesting possibilities. If you have a Modbus, if you want to mix and match IO link and Modbus, to optimize your application, there's some really cool things you could do with this Modbus RTU port on this IO Link Master. Um, then we've got our eight port IO Link Master. So this is the, an eight port variety, eight IO Link Master ports. Again, just like the other controllers, it's multi protocol and it's just one part number. So Ethernet IP, Modbus TCP, and Profinet. Um, and one really cool thing that I, I really like working with customers on, Sean, is is what we could do with custom programming with these devices. These DXM controllers have object-oriented programming, and we have things like action rules that allow you to program logic locally in the controller. And in many applications, we've been the possibility to almost eliminate a PLC entirely for smaller applications. So We've seen applications on small machine builds where people have used our our controllers, our IOLink masters or our DXMR90 X1 Modbus controller to replace um, you know, industrial PCs or even potentially replace PLCs entirely. And so that's where it gets really exciting when you're 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 chatting with with customers on on what we could do with the advanced programmability on these. It's really kind of what sets sets apart in a lot of these applications is the fact that we could solve um, some of these 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 app, smaller applications and replace the PLC entirely because sometimes PLCs can be really quite expensive and, and overkill and overkill for yeah, some very overkill. small applications. Yeah. I mean, if you have, I, I like this. I mean, I ha like having the lot the ability to put the logic in the device. I know other vendors have had this in the past and then they stopped doing it. And I, I think that's a mistake because there are so many applications where you're only using three or four IO and you know, why have to buy a, a PLC unless you just have an extra one lying around, but, and then you have to buy the software and you have to maintain the software and it's, yeah. you know, for tiny applications, it's awesome having the logic in the device. And I think that's very cool. And I'm, I'm just going to go on an aside here back up for a second i mean regular listens listeners know i've been bragging about these devices because when you buy like the x1 and 4k i know for sure when you buy those it does modbus tcp ethernet ip and profinet right you can choose you don't have to buy like there's not an x1 modbus tcp and an x1 tcp ip and an x1 profinet version it's one unit that has the ability to talk whichever one you need, which I think is so cool. Am I right about that? I'm not making that up, right? Exactly right. Yeah, it's multi-protocol. And so you we order one part number, it'll communicate all those different protocols, Ethernet IP, Modbus, TCP, and Profinet for all these different models, which is, which is really great. 
Yeah, that, I mean, that pretty much gets 90% of all the PLCs on the market speak one of those. Some of them speak all of them, but, you know, most PLCs in the world speak one of those natively. And so you can just standardize on this block and use it with any, you know, if your customer specking this or that, you you can use the same product. Yeah. And it's a, uh, you bring up such a good point on the PLC sometimes being overkill. And, and I was chatting with uh, Mike Black. He's one of the manufacturing engineers at, at, at Banner. He actually used these controllers on one of his machine builds uh, for dispensing adhesives to actually build Banner product. And so he's using one of these controllers. And what he's nice. looking at, he's looking at using initially a Becca or a, a sorry, an IPC um and you know it, it added cost so he was looking initially at that and you know when we saw that what we could do with the advanced you know object oriented programming within these controllers uh he was able to replace that he also talked to me about um the the importance of, of in the application reducing costs by eliminating the control cabinet entirely mm -hmm. And he said there's costs associated with that. You have to deal with you know, costs with UL certifications. It has to be certified. And by able to being able to replace the you know, PLC or an IPC in certain cases, um, you could save a lot of a lot of costs and in, in some of these applications uh, for smaller applications, certainly. You know, I, I sat through a presentation that a high volume OEM did. It was about 20 years ago now. And he was talking about this machine mount IO. And he says, look, I know everybody thinks because the I.O. is IP67, it's more expensive and you're going to buy the quick, kit, you know, the M12 connectors and cables and cord sets. And, you know, it's just much more expensive than buying an enclosure and throwing a rack of I.O. in it. He says, in reality, it's not because you save like to your point right now, you, it really isn't more expensive, especially when you start including the cost to wire up that panel, then it becomes much less expensive. But he says that's not the reason he liked it so much. He liked it because they could put a machine together so very quickly because everything is quick disconnects. And he said that's that that is a thing that a lot of OEMs don't think about is time it takes to turn around and build, right? So yeah. if you're going to wire up, let's say 300 IO points to the classic terminal blocks, that's that that is time consuming. I just I just for my training courses picked up a bunch of stuff. And um, so I could expand my courses and I was wiring up all these IO cards to test them out. And I can attest to it. Even after I was doing the seventh, eighth, ninth module, it still takes a long time to wire up 16 IO points. Right. So yeah. um, just the speed, how much faster you can turn around your machines by click, 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 click and go. So back 100%. to you, Sean. That's a great point. It, you know, it saves so much time. And as we all know, time is time is money in a lot of these, these oh, cases. Yeah. And um you know, I've also seen with diagnostics, the, the side of, um, you know, the, I remember stories where a uh, machine would be down and they're trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. And it just turns yeah. out something as simple as a screw terminal. And um, sometimes <laughs> it's, there. You've, you've been in a case where, you know, you see a case where they just didn't tighten down the screw enough and, yep. and that, that could help be eliminated with the connectivity with remote I.O. for sure. I'm raising my hand on that because I've driven for five hours just for that, just to solve that problem. Oh, yeah. you didn't screw down the screw all the way. I've I've been in that position, so that is yeah. so true. That is so true. It happens. It happens for sure. Um, and so when you look at some of these applications and using this is a, a slide that kind of shows how you could use Modbus with that, um, you know, Modbus controller, the DXM or 90X1. This is where we talk about right sizing our I/O. So we've got these different hubs and converters, and you you kind of see them at the bottom. Being able to connect discrete I.O. to these these hubs and these converters and analog I.O. And so we've got different models, whether you're using 4 to 20, 0 to 10 volt signals, NPN, PNP signals. We even got um, serial or Modbus RTU I.O. link masters. So it allows us to connect I.O. link devices onto a Modbus RTU network and then back to the DXM R90 industrial controller. And from there, send it to the to the PLC. So it allows us to use and combine one, two, four, and eight port devices and take advantage of things like being able to connect large quantities of devices to one client port on the DXM R90 industrial controller, but also run long distances. And we've even seen cases where people are using some of our serial data radios, such as the R70 that you see right here on one of those client ports, 
to send data back from a, a remote island of IO from a server radio. So there's a this is a client radio, and you can have a server radio across your factory um, communicating data back that way as well. So really great bundle of products. Um, and the nice thing is these converters are brand agnostic. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to use banner sensors. You know, these these devices will work with other manufacturers' devices, which is a which is a nice advantage. Well, and this is really good too. If you have a bigger, if you're an OEM, you have a larger machine, you don't want to run all your M12s all the way back to the, let's say you have a, a central PLC cabinet. So being able to put, you know, the run, you know, the drop down to Modbus, which is just one run, down to a block with a bunch of IO link inputs, you can actually put those IO link blocks or those IO blocks around the machine and then run Modbus back to your main controller, right? So that exactly. makes a lot of sense. And you're not, you know, some of these machines just are not so compact where everything can run right back to the PLC. So go ahead, back to you, Sean. That's a, that's a great point, Sean. I, I uh, Great, great insight there on, on that. And, you know, I, I think too with just the amount of devices you could take back. It is important, you know, when, when you're talking about um, adding more devices it's where you know you need to start having the conversation though as you get in these larger networks and you're using these devices is the importance of you know speed and that there's mm -hmm. things like too if you get into very large networks is the perhaps might need to be a need for power injection rare but sometimes that becomes a, a thing where you know if you have a lot of devices on one of these networks um being able to use power injection uh, that's for very large networks so um, we don't run into that too much but important to keep note of um, but then we look at right sizing your IO with IO link, and here's kind of a slide that shows our eight port IO link master. And we've got some of our um, eight, one, two, four, and eight port hubs connected. So we've got an eight port hub here. This is our, uh, so this, this IO link master is the DXM R110 8K IO link master. Um, and then we've got our R95C 8B22-KQ. It's a, a eight port discrete in, input and output hub. So a nice thing with banners hubs are that they're bimodal. So what that means is they could do PNP or NPN. It doesn't nice. matter which signal. So it's one part number. You could do NPN or PNP signals. We've also got um, single port varieties. So if you have analog or discrete signals, do you want to bring back to your control system? You just have one. You could use one of these single port converters or hubs. We've got two port varieties as well, and we've also got four ports. So we've got a discrete hub for taking back discrete I.O. It's a four port, but the, we call it right sizing your I.O. And it allows you to kind of mix and match based on your needs. Sometimes if you just want to really keep it simple, you might just want to use a couple of our S15C single port um, hubs and connect one device. Uh, sometimes it makes sense, though, to have more um, ex the expandability aspect. You know, if you maybe don't need them right now, but in the future you might decide to add more I.O., it might make sense to have one of these eight-port hub options or four-port hub options. So it allows you to really quickly uh, scale up the system, but it gives you the flexibility um, in bringing back and mixing and matching, almost like Lego pieces for optimizing your system. And uh, you talk about some of the advantages of these devices. And one, when people look at them compared to some of the other manufacturers in the space, is the unique form factor of these. Um, the side profile of these devices means typically cable bend radius is, is sometimes an issue with the top exit block I.O. style. These are side exit. So what that means is in a lot of cases, um, cable oh, yes. bend radius is less less prevalent. Um, it is less of an issue in a lot of the instances where they use the side profile uh, exit style with these devices. Yeah, no, I see exactly what you're saying there. So you can mount this right on the machine and everything exits around the perimeter of it, not off the face of it. And so yeah. that that will that reduces, you know, I want to ask you a question. I hate to keep throwing these out at you, but That's I'm great. looking at the R45C analog, uh, looks like two analog. Is that are both ports analog in or analog out? Exactly. So that's an important thing with some of these converters. We have models that allow you to take in analog inputs, either 0 to 10 or 4 to 20, or drive analog outputs. And we've got this in both IO Link and, and Modbus RTU hubs. Nice. So if you want to take in an analog signal, well, 4 to 20 or 0 to 10, you could use those two ports for that. Or if you want to drive you know, 
two analog outputs, you could do that as well. So it, it gives you the flexibility and that's a great one. It's almost like a kind of Swiss army knife converter for um, analog IO. Um, and so you could do both. So in a lot of cases, I've seen it with um, some valve applications where a customer is standardizing an IO link, but they still have non IO link devices mm -hmm. in the field that take in a zero to 10 volt signal to control the valve or controller, you know, motor driven roller, for example. And they want to control that um, and they have an IO link system, but they're, they still have these devices, you know, out there that are still dependent on analog. Uh, yeah. It's a great solution for that. Nice. Good catch. I'm glad you brought that up. I forgot to mention that. And so here are different IO link hub options that I was kind of highlighting a little bit in that slide. We've got, like I said before, the, the one port options. So the ability to take in NPN or PNP signals or four to 20 signals in a single port option. These little S15 converters that you're seeing here, uh, if you look at them for the listening audience, they're about the size of a AA battery, just for reference. And they just have M12 connectors. So it's all IP67 connectorized. Then we move into our R45C, and just so everyone knows, the, the S15C, it's a 15 millimeter diameter. The R45C converters are based on the, the size is 45 millimeters. So uh, a lot okay. of the part numbers kind of make, it's based on the, the size of the, the product. But if we look at our R45Cs, this is a model that takes in 4 to 20 or 0 to 10 volt signals and converts it over to, um, uh, or sorry, it, it's an IO link, takes in an, an IO link signal, converts it to analog. So if you want to drive an analog output from your IO link master, these are great converters. And then we get into the dual analog, which is it could do either or. So it could take in uh, analog input on those two ports or could drive two analog outputs on those ports on a on an IO link network. And there it says it right there, analog mirroring. So if you want to bring it into the control system, but mirror it back out, you can yeah. bring it in and then mirror it right back out of that device and also tap off of it to bring it back to the PLC. Exactly. Yeah, and I've got a, sl a slide that highlights. This is a really cool one for retrofitting applications mm -hmm. where there's an existing analog signal and they want to still have that analog signal go back to their PLC, but they want to control a, a light on the P that ha also has a PFM output on, mm -hmm. on one of these ports. So it's a really unique, um, very cool. It's probably one of my favorite converters that we offer or hubs that we offer. It's the, it's this model here. Um, and we've got our four port discrete hub that could do NPN or PNP signals. And we've got our R95C eight port hubs. Um, and a lot of our discrete IO hubs, um, I could talk a, a, a long time about it. I don't want to spend too much time on the part numbers, but the fact that we could do actually logic within the hubs. I'm going to talk about a little bit about that in a little bit on on what we could do with logic residing directly in those discrete hubs that you see there. And so here's kind of a, a slide, Sean, that, that highlights the kind of building block analogy of this, the being able to mix and match these different products can be really powerful in a lot of these these applications if you're using Modbus or or IO Link. Um, here you see is you have our DXM R ninety four K IO Link master. Whoops. And what this has is is the four um, IO Link ports there at the bottom. But then what's unique is it has that Modbus RTU port, so you could use these Modbus hubs that you see on that Modbus chain as well as those four um, IO link master ports, you could use those hubs on, the, on those ports. So it, it allows you to kind of mix and match in, in a lot of these applications to, um, to kind of optimize and optimize your system. The key thing here is flexibility and it's really excellent way to kind of mix and match. And certainly you could just use IO link, you could use just Modbus, or you can mix and match in this particular case. Does that kind of make make sense of this image, Sean? Yeah, I definitely see. If you're going to go to more than 60 feet, that's great because now you don't have to get another um, industrial Ethernet device. You could just do the Modbus RTU over to the other side of the machine and pick up the rest of your signals. That's so true. It's great for overcoming certain distance limitations with mm -hmm. IOLINK. Yeah, with IOLINK, there's the 20 meters is the max, as mm -hmm. you can see on this slide here, from going to, from an IOLINK master to a, an IOLINK device. So here's kind of a, a slide that highlights just a just an image of the S15C. Um, again, about the size of a, 
a double a battery we've got many different models to choose from kind of like a swiss army knife you could you could pick and mix and match these converters to solve a lot of these applications then we go into our r45c's so this these are great if you want to drive a analog output and you you know you're standardizing an io link but you still have devices maybe it's pneumatic actuator like this gif shows uh that's drip controlled by a 4 to 20 signal um these are very common. And then you go into the other converters that we offer, the dual analog, so it could do both. So you could do analog inputs or outputs on either of those ports. So a great flexible option um, if you want to bring back, both bring back analog signals and convert to IO-Link or drive analog outputs from your IO-Link master. So that same converter, I, I'm so I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Sean, because it's a, um, it's a really cool feature of this particular um, dual analog IO link converter. So what we could actually do is what's called port mirroring on this device. So what this means is we could actually take in an analog input on one of those ports on the IO link um, hub or converter in this case, and you could actually mirror that to another port. So we're taking in an analog four to 20 or zero to 10 and we're mirroring it. And what we could actually configure this converter to have is it has IO link on that mail port, but it also has a PFM pin, so pulse frequency modulation. And so what's the big, what's the kind of big deal with this is, well, now we can actually go in to existing analog sensors, whether it be a T30R radar sensor, whether it's a pressure sensor, flow sensor, a sensor with a four to 20 or zero to 10 volt signal already communicating to a PLC. Well, what we could do now is we could, install one of these converters still allow that 4 to 20 signal to go back to the plc so we're not interrupting that at all but now we get that beautiful pfm output to control a light and add a visual factory element to almost almost any analog application without disrupting a, an existing control system and uh, this is kind of more of an end user uh, focus so if you have an existing analog signal but it's another cool feature of uh, our converters, some of the programmability, what you could do with solving some cool applications, improving a visual factory element in a lot of these, maybe a tank level application or a flow application. You want to show personnel in the factory, uh, you know, my tank level is getting too low, my pressure is maybe getting too high, or my flow is getting a little too low, and seeing kind of a red, yellow, green for visual factory element uh, to some of these applications with some of Banner's lighting products, which I think are really, really great. We've also got analog IO link hubs. So if you have, and this is the model for taking in an multiple analog signals. So this is an eight port analog input IO link hub. Very similar in form factor to the discrete hubs. But if you look at this hub, we've got now the, the ability to take in zero to 10 or four to 20 signals. So it could do either zero to 10 or four to 20 signals on one model. It's configurable in that sense. So it's just one model number that could do zero to 10 or four to 20 signals. Another great one if you're using a lot of analog IO. And here's just a, sl a slide that highlights the different form factors of our, some of our discrete IO link hubs. And if you look at discrete IO, it's so common um, out there in, in so many different machine builder applications. And um, some of the differentiators of banner um, with regards to uh, IO link is, is what we could do with some of our, and Mobus is our discrete hubs. Um, we could do logic within the hubs themselves. So what that means is we could do what's called port mirroring. So being able to mirror discrete sensor input to the hub and mirror it as an output to another port on the hub. But we could also do on off delays, one shots, pulse stretchers. So you could configure the hub uh, to do all these little, almost like smart relay applications right there locally in the hub. There's no other real hub manufacturer that could do some of the things we could do with advanced programmability. So what that means is there's some cases where it's almost used as a smart relay. Um, and people are using these devices with counts, with timers. They're turning on an input on one port, waiting five seconds to turn on an output on another port. Being able to solve kind of these unique standalone applications with some of these hubs, again, for really simple applications, this could be a great problem solver. Um, you could actually program the logic right in the IO link hub, which is really, really cool. And what you do is you just use it like an IO link sensor. You configure the hub to do these unique standalone applications. Um, 
Another differentiator uh, with the hubs um, is the four amp power. So on pins one and three on our IO link hubs, it shares the four amps uh, on the M12 connector. That's the limit, but it shares the four amps as needed. So if you have a lot of devices connected to an eight port hub, some manufacturers out there with hubs, they have a half amp limitation on the amount of power you could share to the device that's connected. In some cases, maybe there, you have a device connected on your discrete hub that consumes a lot of current. The nice thing is the four amps with banners hubs is shared as needed on pins one and three. The, the power traces are parallel wired to each port. And so that's a big advantage if um, maybe you have some devices that don't consume much current at all on a hub, but then you have one device uh, that consumes a lot of current. Maybe it's a light or another product. It's a big advantage for for that. It's kind of in some cases it could be a really big deal because um, then you don't have to use power injection, uh, which is which is an important differentiator to know. Uh, and then you look at discrete hubs as well. Like I mentioned before, the ability to do NPN or PNP is is big. We've got a lot of videos on just covering that. Uh, what we could do with unique programming. So I, I encourage you to, to check out some of our demo videos that kind of goes over uh, some of the unique programming features of our discrete hubs. It's pretty cool what we can do. And this is kind of a slide, Sean, that shows uh, the stackability of our form factor. You know, we talk about uh, in some machine builds, spaces at, you know, real estate is a, at a premium. They don't have a lot of real estate to install devices and sometimes in small machines or even large machines they're really tightly packed together and the banners form factor really uh, becomes a, a big advantage in some of these applications where you have the side profile so the cable bend radius is less of an issue but also the stackability being able to stack these on top of each other um, is a, is kind of a really cool advantage um, and i'm sure you've kind of seen some of those applications where you know everything's so tightly packed mm -hmm. and yep. space is constrained and so that's important to, to, to note is you know the fact that banners devices are are stackable yeah i just want to say this for the audio audience we're not stacking them like one on top of another directly this bracket offsets it a little bit so that you can still get to all the connections even if you stack them so just for the audio audience there's a bracket here that when you're stacking one on top of another it offsets it a little bit so all the um so you can get to all the individual ports so i just wanted to throw that out there back to you sean thanks thanks for the, the reminder of that sean that's a great point and and also the fact that you could uh, it offsets it too so you could see the uh, the leds of the block that's underneath so you still get oh, the okay. io leds which is kind of cool there too uh, if you're using two to stack Here's a, a slide that highlights some of our Modbus RTU box, a very similar portfolio to the IO Link uh, uh, product family, um, except in a Modbus variety. So um, if you ever have any questions on these models, I highly encourage you to go to the um, Banner Engineering Remote IO page on the website, but very similar in portfolio. Um, similar with Modbus, it allows you to kind of right size your IO with, you know, one two four and eight port hubs or serial ion link masters which i kind of highlighted before we've got serial ion link masters like this one here that have a modbus rtu communication so you could bring in ion link devices on that network as well you know we talk about overcoming distance limitations so using multiple ion link masters um, we've seen certain cases where you know they want to overcome certain distance limitations you could use the advantage of modbus and ion link to run long distances between your serial IO link masters, such as our four port and our two port serial IO link master, to bring back data and have a very long cable length going back to a Modbus client. So that allows you to kind of mix and match uh, the best of both worlds in this case uh, of IO link and Modbus. So you get, you're able to do things like this. You could use our serial IO link masters. This is a valve bank application where they actually used, they wanted to connect large quantities of hubs. So they used our serial IO link master, which has a Modbus RTU communication. And this image for the listening audience, it almost looks like a spider web of, of IO, but it's essentially showing a IO link master going back to the Modbus client. And then on the IO link master, you have four hubs that are connected to each IO link master. 
but allows you to bring back large quantities of discrete I.O. And in this application, they wanted to do that, but have it on one IP address on the DXM or 90X1 uh, industrial control, which has the four uh, or five Modbus R2 client ports. So a really cool thing is we, we've got both serial I.O. link masters, Modbus R2, and then multi-protocol Ethernet I.O. link masters. So we've got a lot of a lot of things we could do with with flexibility, and that's that's very important. Again, on the on the DXMR ninety four K, being able to use that Modbus R two port to tee into these serial I/O link masters. So if you want to connect more I/O link devices, you have the four I/O link master ports there that you can connect to hubs and sensors. But you also got the Modbus R two port to really expand on the number of of I/O link devices you want to connect back to your PLC. Again, on some cases where you want to run maybe longer distances uh, to your sensors, it could be a great way to overcome those distance limitations. Does that kind of make sense, John, on this, on this slide? Oh, absolutely. And then we get into the fact that also using Modbus RTU, we can make adva take advantage of some of our R70 serial data radio. So some applications you could have IO link sensor data that you want to send back wirelessly across your factory thousands of feet back to a, an industrial controller and then from there to your PLC or your HMI. Um, so in this slide, what we're showing is some IO-Link sensors going back to our uh, serial IO-Link master. So uh, IO-Link master with Modbus RTU communications. They're going to a server radio and sending that data back across the factory to what's a, a client radio that you see right here. So there are a lot of cool things we could do with those serial uh, uh, IO-Link masters that have Modbus RTU communications, taking advantage of the fact that we could use our serial radios to send the data back uh, wirelessly across your factory as well. So that's, that's kind of the portfolio. And, and if you have any questions on it, I highly encourage you to go to the remote IO section on the banner website. But the things we could do with the advanced metrics and simplified programming, it's, it's really cool. So having logic programmed directly in the controllers, Using object-oriented programming, multi-protocol, um, or uh, uh, object-oriented programming, script basic, uh, action rules right there locally in these controllers, you could solve these applications standalone and replace your IPCs, replace PLCs, and some of these very simple applications where PLCs might be overkill. Banner also is, is really starting to expand on our customization. So being able to do pin level customization. So what that means is if you need an, a block that has, say, IO link master on one port, analog input on another port, discrete IO on another port, we're really starting to do pin level or port level customization for customers. We're also looking at expanding our offering of pre-programmed units. So if you need a device for your application that has a certain programming, a certain recipe that you want to continuously order, uh, we could work on building part numbers for that so it can make it as seamless as possible. Something nice. as easy as customizing an IP address or even having something like a program, uh, script basic program embedded in a block, we can do that. Um, Kitting is another thing where we're doing. If you want to order, say, a kit of products, whether it's a an iLink Master and several iLink hubs, you could absolutely do that. And um, we're really expanding out what we could do with uh, customization. Uh, if you need a custom label, if you need um, something that has your branding or logo on the product, well, we could do that as well. So if you have any interest in what we could do with regards to pin level customization, pre-programmed units, with some of those programming, advanced programming, custom ports, custom labels and kidding, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you know, we've got a lot of things we could do there. Um, and I'm not sure, Sean, if you've seen applications where, you know, some it might be beneficial in some cases for machine builders. That they they want to really standardize in something, just having something ordered and pre-programmed. It could eliminate some of the time factor with your, when you're programming it yourself and just save time and a little bit of money on, on installation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Especially if um, if they're going to be using it. And I, just for the audio audience, the script basic, we're looking at a little picture of it here. Standard if then and if type of syntax. So very, very easy for most of us to uh, to implement. We're really talking like a basic language there. And, you know, if you had something right that that 
you know, especially people are showing on staff these days. If you had a particular program that you needed for, it was so great that you guys will preload it for them and give them a special part number. You know, that way they don't have to, you know, you can do it right at the factory and they don't have to worry about having staff to do that. You know, once you come up with the program, you can order it with it preloaded. That's very cool. Yeah, absolutely. So an example where the, the advanced programmability within the DXM came into play was actually here at Banner. Um, Mike Black, who's one of our manufacturing engineers, was was building a, a robotic adhesive application. So it's kind of in a nutshell, this small machine was being used to actually build um, Banner products. It was disp automatic dispensing. And so what it actually incorporated was a machine and a, a robot that dispenses adhesive repeatedly. Sometimes when you're doing something like dispensing an adhesive by hand, you could run into consistency issues. You know, robots typically are, are more uh, fine tuned, so it's going to be more consistent. So initially it was, it was he was looking at an IPC, which was, you know, several thousand dollars. And when he learned about what we could do with the object-oriented programming with our DXM controllers, he's able to solve this application completely standalone um, with one of our DXM controllers with object-oriented programming, replace any need for an IPC, replace the need for a control cabinet. And in this case, he was using a lot of discrete I.O. So he actually made use of banners, discrete I.O. link hubs, bring it back to an I.O. link master. And within the DXMs, within the ILink master or the, the DXM controller, he had his logic. And so in this case, uh, he was able to significantly um, save a lot of save a lot of money on this application by just that alone. But also the one thing that stood out to me is the fact that he didn't need to use a control cabinet. And there's certain things that happen when you have to, you know, you need to use a control cabinet, and he's able to eliminate the need for that. And there's a video on this on YouTube if everyone wants to check it out uh, on the Banner Banner Engineering uh, YouTube page. Another thing when you look at our profile and talking about some of the things we could do is space saving. We've seen our IO-Link masters and, and devices and blocks being deployed in AGVs. You know, we talk about the unique form factor, the fact that these are stackable, but also the fact that you're able to save a lot of space in some of these areas where space is really tight. And um, so AGVs has been an area we've been seeing a lot of activity on with our some of our IOLink masters in particular. And for the listen only, uh, the listen only audience, here's just an image where it shows an AGV, and we actually have an IOLink master installed within the machine. It's kind of a cutaway drawing of an AGV showing some of our IOLink masters and different devices going back to the IOLink master um, on the on the AGV itself. Uh, here's another application. This is at Banner. We have cooling racks, and initially it was a, a, a PLC that was controlling it, but they had uh, different heat treating processes for Banner product, and we're actually able to um, do the programming within our IO-Link master to control the, the lights that you see on this image to give factory workers uh, a visual element on what the status was, the cooling. So 24 hours, they would see that the, the light was a certain status, so green. And as time went down, it would start to change colors to give them an indication, uh, changing from blue to green, that the the process was was done, that basically the, the cooling was completed, it's just to give workers a visual factory element to see when the cooling process was completed. Basically, how this would work is they'd load a rack, and there'd be a discrete proximity sensor that would detect the the tray being loaded into the rack and then the timer would start. So very simple logic, but in this case, PLC was being used initially, but was complete overkill. It was, you know, very expensive. And we're actually able to save a lot of money um, on the fact that there's no PLC or control con control enclosure needed in this application uh, right here at Banner. So just this is a, a 30, uh, you know, a 10 minute drive away from me right now, um, currently being used at the Banner facility. So I really appreciate the time, uh, Sean, on, on chatting with you about some of our solutions. It, it's, it's been really exciting. I, I'm so excited to be a part of the, the team here at Banner and kind of working with some of these solutions. And I want to encourage the audience, if, if you have any questions on it, just feel free to reach out to us anytime. Um, there's also some great content on our website on Remote.io. 
Uh, some of our things I've discussed today, you could find a lot more information on the products. If you go to bannerengineering.com, there's actually a whole remote IO actual topic at the very top. You'll be able to navigate to remote IO and click on all the different products that we've been discussing here today. Um, Sean, I, I can't thank you enough again for for taking the time uh, to chat on remote IO. It's been always great chatting with you. Any 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 questions from you on with regards to uh, remote IO from from Banner? No, I think you nailed it, Sean, and I really appreciate you coming back on the show and uh, very exciting product line. I'd love to hear from you guys out there listening. Are you using this and what's your response been? Uh, do you have an application that you're thinking of using it on? I, um, you know, because I'm teaching and doing these podcasts, I don't get to get out there in the field much anymore. But uh, it looks just like, you know, be- between the uh, multifunctional or multi uh, support for different Ethernet protocols to the Modbus support, to the IO Link support, to the digital IO support, it just seems like you can really fit a lot of these, you know, machine mount applications with your products and it just it's a cool and you know this this tied in with all the other stuff we've talked about in our previous podcast it's a it's definitely a great product line so sean thank you again for coming on the show really appreciate it thank you sean i really really appreciate it have a great rest of day thanks thanks again for having me on i really really appreciate it well i hope you enjoyed the episode and i want to thank sean foley for coming back on the show to talk to us all about banners remote io products I think there's a great mix there between the IO link and the Modbus and then the gateways to Ethernet IP, Modbus, TCP, and Profinet. So what a great compilation of different products all in one show. With that said, if you did enjoy the show, please remember to give us a like, a sub, and a share. That is the fuel that keeps this show on the air and keeps us coming back each week. And if you want to join our community, you can do so over at automation.locals.com. It's free to join. It's $2 a month if you have questions for me. And uh, you'll also find all of my training courses over at theautomationschool.com. And with that said, I want to wish you all an awesome week ahead. Uh, Remember, no matter what happens, stay courageous, stay fearless, and try to stay positive. And until next time, my friends, peace.